Louder with Crowder Studios, protected exclusively by Walther. And Hopper. Thanks to our funding from Mug Club, those false plaintiffs have pulled their hard strikes again right on time. To the second. They always do. I fight them for you and we win every time. And you always act like it's a miracle. Oh, my dear half-Asian tattoo. When each Mug Club member is paying $99 annually, $69 for students, veterans, or active military, he, she, or Z deserves miracles. Right, boss. That's right. I just wanted you to think if you're watching this in the archive that you were too hammered to watch this show, but it's actually just me <laughs> moving around oh, okay. that right. way. We have Senator Rand Paul on the Ooh, show today. Boom! Uh, too hammered to be on the show. Question of the day, what was your main takeaway from Wednesday's hearing on bar? The highlight, if you will, we're going to be talking about that, yeah. Venezuela, and usually I introduce him last, rightfully so, but he is back, G. Morgan boom. Jr., a married baby. man, oh. and I will right. say, I was official. I can confirm, I was at the wedding, okay. and I was very okay. surprised. She was actually just a cardboard cutout of Jack Lane. I was uh, okay. <laughs> dumbfounded. She still said yes. <laughs> so you came back from what's the wine of the day? The, the wine. Of, so apparently, when I was gone, there was a bit of a thing about boxed wine. Oh. So <laughs> boxed wine of the day, baby. Here we go. I am not <laughs> too. I don't know why Brian thinks that's so funny. <laughs> well, no, because he did I, it. I, I, I would go and I was would go shopping and I'd be like I'd go on Twitter saying well since I'm feeling for Gerald the wine of the day is should I should I pick this cheap red or this cheap cheap is, is, is there good box wine is there any yes. good there yeah there's plenty of I mean for people who just want everyday wine it's not bad would you marry a but woman who likes box wine I did. <laughs> oh, <laughs> Jack well, Lane likes box wine. <laughs> she likes That's great a, wine now too. I'm, I'm, okay. I'm exposing her to a lot of great wines that she's really enjoying. So All right. Yes. Okay. Uh, she, quarter Black Garrett, of course. What's up, Don? Uh, and uh, yeah. brought again there in uh, third chair. How are you doing? Brodigan? I'm doing great. How are you? Good. We're we're, we're doing well. And uh, leading the Very news well. before. So Very good wedding. Too, you yeah. went to France. Yeah, I can <laughs> imagine. <laughs> yes. Released oh, all that come, tension. Of course, you had to have the Jack Lane cutout laminated. That's true, unless you want to. It's easy. It's easier to clean that. Life. He single-handedly <laughs> keeps Amazon's nanocloth storefront in business. That's right, baby. Leading those things are remarkable if you haven't used Fantastic. them. Fantastic nanocloth. It's like a microfiber cloth. Yeah. Times a million. Yeah. It's just okay. take, take anyway. It doesn't matter. Super Le micro. Leading the news. Uh, of course, you know. Attorney, and we're going to get into Venezuela. That's the most. Oh, yes. We have yeah. to talk about Barr because yes. we have to. Yes. But Venezuela, Absolutely. I think, is really we have a job. Week, to do. So yes. uh, William Barr. He didn't attend the House Judiciary uh, hearing t today, for Thursday, those who are listening to the archive. Now, the main reason was a dispute over who'd be doing the questioning. Yeah. And he felt that he left it all on stage yesterday. And since we already analyzed it yesterday for Mug Club members and the Ash Wednesday, and you're yeah. probably tired of hearing about it, uh, we're just, well, that brings us to uh, uh, Bill Barr's Deaf Comedy Jam. All right, so if you like expect an analysis, yeah. Yeah. we ain't got it, yeah, though. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, you know, because yeah. this is just like the greatest oh. hits for people who missed it for, for Bill Barr. Uh, let's go to Our Bill Barr's yeah, greatest hits, my it. boy, Senator Blumenthal, clip one. Yeah. Did anyone, either you or anyone on your staff, memorialize your conversation with Robert Mueller? Yes. Who did that? Uh, there were notes taken of, of the call. 
May we have those notes? No. the power to make the decision about whether or not the evidence was sufficient Prose to make a determination of whether there had been an obstruction of justice. Prosecution memos go up to the supervisor. In this case, it was the, you know, the attorney general and the deputy attorney general who, who decide on the final decision. And that is based on the memo as presented by the U.S. Attorney's Office. Oh! He just showed you I just want to nail down, you used the word spying mm -hmm. about authorized DOJ investigative activities. Frankly, we went back and looked at press usage, and up until all the, the four outrage a couple of weeks ago, it's commonly used in the press to refer to authorized activities, such as referring to the But it's not FISA commonly court, used by the court. department. What? It is not commonly used by the department. My time it's is... commonly up. used by me. Okay, I'm not gonna lie, I'm a little Ooh. winded. Ooh. Ooh. Man, how's Being it going, man? Yeah. A person of color is exhausting. It's difficult, yes. <laughs> uh, this is awesome. Oh, man. Man, that, that, was, that was good. Wow, that was everything good. is so yeah. bright now. Okay, so for people, we could just, just don't, <laughs> now it's just, Brodigan is just making all the noise. Like, can you want to ruffle some, <laughs> some chip bags into the microphone? Yeah. ASMR. I, I, was, I, I was gonna put the sunglasses so, back on. So I don't know what happened. We them. talked about this yesterday. This is it, just, we don't want to provide a full-on yeah. analysis because everyone's been doing it. Uh, but yesterday yeah. I said, watch, you're going to see tomorrow, the clips are going to be Kamala Harris and Hirono, and everyone's going to be saying, this is the ownage. This yeah, is the yeah, ownage yeah, because yeah. it's a sound bite. But none of it is true. That's no. what matters. Uh, I think we have Harris or just Hirono? Hirono. Okay, this is the one. I want to show I'm you the sorry. clip that the left has been showing as their big victory lap for context. Here's Hirono in, in, in questioning. Do you think all of the things that President Trump did are okay? I don't this think is not a crime, but do you think it's okay for the president to do the what he did? The fire investigation was about illegality. The now it's, do you think it's okay for from the president to do what he did? And I don't think the evidence supports the proposition. So I guess you think it, it's okay. To stop the investigation. <laughs> do you think it's okay for a president to ask his White House counsel to lie? Uh, which Look, if you're just going to go back to where the which event are you talking You're telling me that it's okay. Let me ask you, do you think it's okay for a president to offer part to people who don't testify against him Wait, to threaten the family of someone <laughs> what are you talking about hmm. does is that okay when did he offer a, a pardon to someone i think you know what i'm talking <laughs> about please uh, oh please, mr oh, attorney pardon. general you know give us some credit for knowing what the hell is going on around here with you not really i, I give you no credit no <laughs> not at all no, Hirono. that's, that's no, ballsy zero. right there <laughs> like, so I, well, hold on. No can you points. can you give me any specifics Okay, stop with the games. Well, hold on a second. <laughs> Does this matter? You play game now. You don't play game here. Hold on a second. Is it, now, is that a racial stereotype? Uh, possibly. And then Kamala Harris asked a question. She asked him, she said, did, the White, uh, did Donald Trump or the White House ask you to investigate anybody? What? What kind of a question? And they're going, look at this. Oh, someone asked the succinct and pointed yeah. questions of Kamala Harris. It could not be less, less poignant. <laughs> yeah. Nice. And the Dems just won't let go of this. Like, it, it, she obviously has been caught right there. And she, Give us some credit for knowing what we're talking about. No. You, no. Have, you get no, no credit. Not at all. This is a losing strategy for you guys. How do you think this is a win to keep getting owned like this and on national I, television? By the way, I saw uh, uh, on the Young Turks, they were talking about this, and they said, uh, we agree with the report that maybe there's no collusion, but there could have been obstruction. That's There could have been obstruction. So, oh, come on. Hold on a second. Oh, no. If you say there's no collusion, you agree. How can there be obstruction? And they're arguing now, his business ties with Russia. Hold on a second. Hold yeah. on a second. That's not what you called an investigation for. Yeah. No. That's not how, that's, not you want to set that kind of precedent where someone pulls you over for a broken taillight? Oh, wait, your taillight's not broken. Yeah, hey, but I want to bring you into the, into the shop because I, I think maybe you hit your kid. Do you have any proof? <laughs> no. Wait, wait, no. You call for an investigation. Yeah. It's been done. He's not, well, no, let's go to business. They never want to stop. That's the point. Yeah. That's why I don't want to analyze it. He is the smartest guy in the room, though, and I did enjoy watching it. Here's your other hot <laughs> take of the week. 
According to Yahoo Game of Thrones, they keep killing off the entire uh, immigrant population. Oh. And that's a problem. Apparently. I mean, they're not wrong. They totally <laughs> all died. <laughs> they, 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 if they killed off the show, that'd be okay. Yeah, oh, at this point, on. I'm Team White Walker. Where soon. once Full it seemed crap. like the show had something to say about the topic of immigration, I'm no longer sure it's interested in such heady ideas <laughs> anymore. <laughs> uh, Yahoo, spoiler alert, you're going to hate episode six. Yeah, that's not. <laughs> oh my gosh, the, the, the article for the goes vengeance. on. Goes on to it makes a really good point. Maybe the, there was a wall for a reason. They didn't understand the threat on hey. the other side of the wall. Hey. And I'm like, huh? That's like real life right now. Well, wasn't it to keep funny. out the gingers because it's a recessive gene Pretty and they taint much. your gene pool? You yeah. don't want to have that. I'm, I'm actually curious what a White Walker taco would taste like. I have, oh, I have no idea. Very cold. I'm not sure. <laughs> I, I, ima- I, I imagine I'm would, I imagine it would. Uh, they would stay away from the spice. I don't think a show like that is supposed to be talking about those ideas anyway. They weren't Who making cares? any kind it's of a, a point. Well, this but... has gotten way too analytical for something that was meant to be stupid. <laughs> International. By the way, people listening to people listening on audio, fault. we get email. Just just watch it. Yes. Okay. <laughs> but what is this? It doesn't make any sense. In international news, anyway, a club is now teaching young boys uh, how to be alpha males in order oh. to fight K-pop's influence in China. Right. Hey, I this, agree with this. This comes from the LA Times. I agree with this. Yeah. Tang Haiyan founded the Real Man oh. Training Club to combat China's masculinity crisis. Part of the backlash against the makeup and earring wearing male TV, film, and K-pop <laughs> idols. <laughs> Leave it to China. And uh, Hyatt's methods are actually being called oh. controversial, particularly oh. given his policy of hunting down and executing the entire cast of Glee. So that seems as though... Oh, wow. Oh. <laughs> I was about to say that. That original Photoshop, it was so close with the crying kid from Glee, we had to zoom in. Oh, no, that, that, yeah. To me, the oh. funniest thing about that picture actually goes back to the picture where you were like, what about the gay guy from Glee? You need to be more specific. Right, yeah, pretty much. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, it's kind of all, everybody from Glee. Yeah, w- one of the guys was actually quoting, he said, 20% percent of the people were uh, men were unfit for military service and he went on to list like things that matter you know like they yeah. couldn't run they were out of shape they were watching too many youtube videos and they ate too much and i was like well yeah, i'm, no, I'm sorry what was, the article. what was why is that the the thing that ends up on the line they like strip off, for service they strip <laughs> off his badges <gasps> that's because you are whack <laughs> you that's do homework on your own time <laughs> you bring great shame oh, with whack <laughs> oh God! And and we're and Hirono's like, do you think it's good to w-? <laughs> And the funny oh. thing is, we're supposed to be concerned that China is going to take over the world. Yeah, yeah. yeah. they're, too, they're busy. too busy watching videos. That, and they do have a lot. Well, if they're getting rid of them, that must mean it's the exception. So they have a lot of time on their hands. Ooh, Speaking of which, yeah. Moby, <laughs> in his new memoir, he says that he Moby. was drinking heavily uh, to process his grief over 9/11, Jeez. and uh, he claims that he rubbed his. Uh, Doniger on President Donald Trump. <laughs> this comes from Daily Beast. He said, I drank a shot of vodka to brace myself, pulled my flaccid P word out of my pants, <laughs> okay. and casually walked past Trump trying to brush the edge of his jacket with my wiener. <laughs> Luckily, he Why? didn't seem to notice. And actually, we uncovered exclusive audio oh, from yeah. the concert in question. Oh, wow. Duh. Duh. Whoa, bye. Oh, gross. <laughs> and immediately, <laughs> uh, copyright from Moby. Yes. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. That was instant. The, the, the funny thing is, he's talking about, like, he's drinking, he's doing drugs, he's having sex in tetanusy bathrooms, so he's doing all of these things, and then says that Donald Trump is the bad person in this story. Right, yeah. You're out doing all these things, and Trump's the bad guy? That's gross, man. And, and you that, rubbed your penis on him? Why? Because he cut AIDS funding. Right, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You're doing illegal drugs, sleeping with random people, and drunk for three months. And you suck. <laughs> Moby, that's the only yeah. song anyone that's remembers the from main Moby. Thing My mom suck. worked with Moby on the French Canadian uh, Patrice Lecrier show. Was so late, and she's he, to blame. He came in, and she, he was he was a, he was a jerk back then. Yeah, but I, I just find it funny that this is the first time you've heard Moby's name since like he got dissed by Eminem in the diss track, right. and he still is the one who looks like a douche in the situation. Right, <laughs> it, pretty much. Which by the, the not only is that sexually sexual assault, but honestly, I don't really know how it's an insult to the person yeah. who, who is unwill. He's the only unwilling participant. You yeah. rubbed your penis on another man. <laughs> yeah. And not to mention... That's embarrassing for you. <laughs> not for him. It, isn't that something you would like do in elementary school or something like that? Yeah. Like, the, the, Where did you go to grade school? <laughs> Apparently a lot tougher place than yes. you did. Yeah. If you got a penis rubbed on you, it was on you. Yeah. you know, kindergarten, kindergarten. I don't know if I'd call that tough. <laughs> you know, so it was Neverland Academy. Were, what your, are you were your teachers about? the village people? Exactly. What school did you go uh, to? No, but if you did something stupid like that... I got like punched. That, did you ever once have somebody rub their schmeckle on you? No, no, but I think kindergarten is his code word for honeymoon. Yes, that's fair. <laughs> I had somebody try to like put the, like if you had your hand on your hip in the in the locker room or something like that, somebody would come up and like do it. It'd be funny to their friends. You know what I mean? Uh. Like they try to touch you and you're like, oh, get away from me. 
You don't remember stuff like that? No. no. You were telling me an that Oxford story. Oxford professor uh, now is arguing <laughs> that invisible a- cut out of Jacqueline Lane. Uh, invisible <laughs> aliens. Damn you. Are interbreeding with humans. This comes this from is important. Oxford student Dr. Young Hei Chi. In case we didn't have all the Asians mad at us yet. <laughs> yeah. In his, in his 55-minute presentation, he cited an abduction researcher in the U.S. who argued that aliens' primary purpose is to colonize the Earth uh-huh. by interbreeding with humans to produce a new hybrid species. Right. Second-generation hybrids are, according to Jacobs, walking unobserved among us. He also went on to note that he is single. <laughs> Of course, some suspect ulterior motives given uh, his recent launch of Invisible Aliens to have sex with Match.com. Oh, it seems as though yeah. there is a conflict oh, of interest. Which, that's unfortunately awesome. for him, most of all, proved to be unfruitful. Yeah, that's pretty sad. <laughs> hey, everybody gets blocked awesome. every once in a while. I just don't think he's my type. Long walks on the beach? Could you be less original? <laughs> I, just, I just have one request. If there's... That if there's an elf comeback, it's because of this show. I hope so. Yeah. There was an elf Please. comeback, wasn't there? I thought there was. If there's a wasn't second there? elf comeback, it's I, because I, of the I show. I really wanted <laughs> elf to us. be better than it was. That's yeah. how everyone I, I, feels about it. I think you're, you're looking elf. back with rose colored glasses on yeah. that show. You look back, it is just, it is paint by. Ba- paint by numbers that that don't even line up. Yeah, exactly. You're like, well, hold on a second. Where this is this is a number. This this has three digits. <laughs> it only goes up to six. <laughs> That's how bad Alf is. Yeah. Is, uh, isn't this the kind of story though that you do? Uh, the kind of article that you write that gets you punted from all kinds of academia? Like you're never allowed back it in. Should be not an academia. This is, no, no. no, no you this re- is this you should be rewarded for it, no, right? This should That's be because no, no. You don't. You misunderstand. You, you actually Pulitzer. studied the relation between uh, interdimensional invisible aliens hybridizing okay. with humans in relation to climate change. So oh, four yeah, million dollar grant. Yes, okay. makes sense. By the way, the winner of last week's trivia contest is uh, Andrew Morales oh. at DJAM32, who knew that Brodigan dressed up as Spider-Man. I for knew the that Oscars one too, but I wasn't eligible. You were not. Mm. Isn't Morales? Isn't that the Spider-Man in the Morales. cartoon one? It's Miles. Miles. Oh, oh okay. Miles Morales. Yeah. It's a great uh, movie. Okay, just a Latino name. All right, which brings us to uh, the top five lessons learned from Venezuela. Let me ask you this: What have you learned most from the story unfolding in Venezuela? Everyone's been talking about Bar. This has been a little lost in the shuffle. Yeah. Um, Nothing surprising. No, (laughs) they've really taught us a lot. So obviously they've reached a boiling point, right? Uh, The the citizens have been staging massive demonstrations against the dictator Maduro. And by the way, how do you pronounce the name of the legitimate president? Oh gosh, I don't know. Well, I know. Is it Trump? Is, is Trump. it? Is it, is it <laughs> we'll just say Juan. His last name Trump. is very hard for me to pronounce Juan. properly. Juan, President Juan Guaido. Gu- 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 I don't know. Juan, I'm not gonna, not Juan gonna work Guido. Here but anyway, they've, they've been uh, there have been demonstrations going on, uh, obviously against dictator Maduro, who is yeah. um, not oh. recognized. So the, so Juan, the other guy, recognized as the interim president <laughs> by both the United States. This is important to note, and. Other nations. Um, actually, I think we do. We have a clip and a freeze here yes, to see, freeze. show you what's going on. We, we just froze. Yeah. We can't show it um, because they've been uh, running over dissidents with oh. tanks. And yeah. Maduro is uh, for people who haven't been following. Let me give you a brief kind of history lesson. He's he's a socialist turned dictator. Uh, but I, re- I repeat myself. <laughs> is that better? Yeah. Slaughtering <laughs> civilians. And, yeah. and this is this is what's so important. People say, well. Ha- no, this is an example of pure socialism, okay? Yeah. The most tragic thing here is that it is entirely predictable. This yes. isn't the first yeah. time this kind of a government has run right. people over with tanks. tanks. No, Thanks. it happens all the time. Armored personnel carriers in that state, but it doesn't matter. They ran them over. Right. And uh, I was going to say, like, the, the most disturbing thing is, like, what's going on, actually going on in Venezuela now is the stuff that we say sarcastically to socialists in this country yeah. that yeah. it's yeah. going to turn into. Right. Yeah, exactly. And, and before you say that it's not true socialism, let me walk you through the top lessons we've learned a- 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 as to why it is. Uh, Lesson number five, by the way, is that democratic socialists are going to hate lessons four through one. Uh, <laughs> hit the notification bell and the bookmark the page. Join up at Mug Club, by the way, because we're hitting yeah. everything's demonetized now. Yes, of course, yes, subscribe yes. on iTunes. Uh, so <laughs> the fourth lesson that I think is is, is most important here is that socialism doesn't work. And I know Shocker. this is a lot of people say, "Well, this isn't." No, no, hold on a second. We're not talking about about places like Venezuela. Actually, do you know how I know you? D- Bernie Sanders and celebrities have long mm. praised Venezuela oh, yeah. and other South American socialist countries. Yeah. What they did it when their economies seemed to work. Way back in, what was it, 1961, they invaded Cuba. And everybody was totally convinced that Castro was the worst guy in the world, that all the Cuban people were going to yes, rise up yeah. in rebellion against Fidel Castro. Right. They had forgot that he educated their kids, gave them health care, totally transformed the Killed society. Ah. You know, it's funny, sometimes American journalists talk about how bad a country is because people are lining up for food. That's a good thing. 
In other countries, but, people don't line up for food. But the there's rich a get difference. The food and the poor starve to death. Oh, he that. doesn't understand. His view is skewed because no, there's no lineup in the prune right. juice aisle. By the way, <laughs> when people argue that it's not real, so, do you know how I know that it's not true? Still today, okay? Bernie still has an article on his website what? today, right now, that claims Venezuelans are living the American dream better than those in the United States. Oh to, my God. Today, right now. right now, right now, and I guarantee you, after this show, they'll probably wait two weeks until this blows over and then remove it, and then you can time machine go back to today, <laughs> right now, this Thursday. What's the date? May 2nd. Thursday, yeah. May, May 2nd. May 2nd still says on Bernie Sanders' website, official website, that Venezuelans are living the American dream. Is that lining up for a toilet paper and having to eat dogs because you're starving yeah. to death? I don't remember that being the American the, the dream. The idea, you cannot, you cannot simply say it's not real socialism because it doesn't work now. You praised it. Bernie mm -hmm. still praises it. This is what you wanted. It's what you got. It's over. You're done. Screw your attempted pivot to Denmark. They don't want you! <laughs> Every I don't time. want you! Yeah. I I don't love you, <laughs> but I will give you one more chance. Yes, dear. <laughs> um, and the irony of all ironies here is that, that Bernie Sanders is setting up that capitalists are the worst people, right? Rich capitalists are the people that you have to hate. They're the ones that is take, they're well, taking from the economy. I don't put words in Not that you have to hate they're the worst people, but he does vilify them he more okay, than fine. socialist government. He does right. yes. give the benefit yeah. well, of the doubt. He they're the villain. altruism yes. to socialism. They're the villain yeah. in the story, right? And he's supposed to be the heroine coming in to save you. He becomes the villain if his Heroine, system, nice. <laughs> right? He, ah, he, becomes, he becomes that same villain, right? Because who ends up with all the power, money, and control? The right, people yeah. in government. Yeah, and right. who are the people that end up taking advantage of everybody else once they get that power? Right. The people in well, government. That's why it's when, people say it's when people say democratic socialism. By the way, Maduro was, he was elected. Yeah. 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 And yeah. If you say it was a special election because Chavez died, fine. So did Ch Chavez was elected. <laughs> yeah. he, you asked for the this. The scales people? were tipped a little bit by endorsements from one Jeff Spicoli and Bernie Sanders. Still pretty fair and free. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, yeah. leftists, you can't blame you can't blame this on corrupt leaders. No. When your system, this is what the, the system of socialism is, what grants them unbridled power in the first place. Exactly. The fact yep. that a socialist turns into a dictator because you created the sole environment where he can become an all-powerful dictator. Is your fault. Yes. And we already did a video debunking uh, John Oliver's lies, specifically on yeah. Venezuela, why it failed. You can watch it on the channel. Um, but let me give you kind it's of a brief summary off. for people who don't understand. They try and say, well, it's about the economy. No, okay. Venezuela, most oil rich country in the world, yeah. One of them, more so yeah. than Saudi Arabia. A lot of people don't know this. Yeah. Chavez reserves. Uh, had the state run the oil industry instead of investing it back into the oil industry, right. yes. investing profits Or back. the economy to grow other sectors. They used it to pay for a ton of socialist programs. That's yeah. why people liked them for a while, creating a bubble that burst when the oil market didn't do that well. So when people right. say it's all about oil, no, no. What was a road bump for the capitalist economies was an absolute disaster for yes. Venezuela. Train so wreck. before these protests, this is what's important to note. Right mm -hmm. now you see them being run over with tanks and shot right. by their government. Yeah. It seems severe. But before this, they were starving. Give, they were digging through trash for food. Yeah. Predimata says it is the only way he can eat. No, no, no. At least we have not died of hunger. While yeah. he dislikes having to do this, he says he finds food that is edible. So, so socialism doesn't just kill people by running them down with, with tanks or shit. It, it starves them first. Yeah. yeah. Right. Well, and, and socialism pr presumes that there is this benevolent class of geniuses out there that are able to run the economy and take care of everybody better than right. anybody else would be, right? N history has never shown that to be the case. Anyone that gets into power and has power like that historically has always, like you said, led to being a dictator and killing their citizens. That's why I can't stand West Wing. Every time you watch it, they just assume <laughs> that everyone who happens to work for Martin Sheen yeah, has it brilliant. right. Yeah, exactly. That, why, why is that the case? Where does that come from? You've never seen an example of that in history. Why would you think it would happen now? They didn't do it right. <laughs> yes. But they're, I mean, but they're doing it the no, way no, no, you, on, you They're doing it the way you told them to do it. Crap. Uh, <laughs> I don't mean, look, I don't mean, a, I don't mean a successful socialist country. Do I mean a leader. you think it's nice to hold Bernie Sanders to his own words? <laughs> That's just mean. Give us credit for knowing what we're talking about. You don't. You know nothing. Uh, third oh, here, this is, this is important. And I, I don't want to be simplistic, so let me, let me back this up. Uh, gun rights are necessary for a free society. Essential. So Duff. here you can see someone on MSNBC... Surprise, actually admitting that Venezuelans are completely powerless because they don't have huh. gun rights. You have to understand in Venezuela, gun ownership is not something that is open to everybody. So if the military have the gun, they oh, have weird. the power. And as long as Nicolas Maduro controls the military, he controls the country. Uh-oh, uh -oh, did I just say that out loud? 
That would never oh, happen here, though. Come on. That no, would never happen is it, here. Is it, was that Tucker Carlson in a fat suit? <laughs> How did that make air? And here's the thing. I yes. know what people are going to say. That people have been saying this nonstop on social media. Like, and it's the, what they call the reverse nirvana fallacy. I think they call it that in either, in either uh, rhetoric, logic, mm. or philosophy. It's yeah. hard to know which is taught in college. I remember I learned about this in college. We'll, the we'll idea call that, it that. Well, hold on a second. They don't, they, if they had guns, do you think it would fix the problem here? The government has tanks. Okay, hold on a second. Uh. So? <laughs> yeah. so, so, so let's before yeah. we get into the statistics so do, let me ask you this do you think it's a better scenario that citizens are right. being defenselessly run over by tanks from their government as opposed to a civil war scenario where they fight back so because they're completely defenseless right now and they're getting bazooka to high heaven yeah. you think they should have no way to defend themselves I, I, I don't understand the argument and by the way it's also incorrect with an unarmed population Maduro is barely hanging on to power yeah. okay if you dump 300 million guns into the mix He'd be, he'd be through. Yeah, they're doing right. right. with good. rocks and bottles right now. Can you imagine if they were yeah. armed in any this way? This is the idea. It's like, well, they would just nu nuke. Well, no. It, no it, there's wouldn't. a ground war that needs to be fought. And right yeah. now, they are fighting without guns. And the yeah. Second Amendment is designed specifically. This is where people miss it when they talk about it being hunting. I, I know yeah. I sound like a broken record, but it's designed specifically to prevent this kind of government from even attempting yeah. this sort of tyranny. Yeah. Well, but that would never happen here. Yeah, that's the, only, that's yeah, the next exactly. argument. It would never happen here. Never so happened. let's just never make really. sure that we have no fail safe. Take, take the United States, for <laughs> yeah. example. If you look at the numbers, we have a population of 320 something million people, okay? Yeah. We have 300 something million guns. I think it's over 30%, oh yeah, too cute Maddie has the overlay. It is, <laughs> it's over 30% it's over of households yeah. who own guns. Our total military population is just over 2 million. That's including active and reserve personnel. Yeah. There's no chance of the United States gunning down its people because they know the citizenry is so armed. It cannot yeah. happen. And if you think, I, again, you, you think that genocide is better in Venezuela than a civil war, I need to hear your argument when you yeah. say that mm. guns in the hands of civilians wouldn't help. I just don't agree. No, yeah. no, absolutely. You have to have some kind of a protection. If these people had guns, Maduro would have stopped a long time ago knowing that they would have come after him if he made those kinds of decisions right. that led to the conditions they're in now. He would have had a check against him, even if it wasn't used. Just like we have a historical precedent for all socialist, Marxist, communist governments doing this, <laughs> do we have any kind of a precedent oh. for armed, pop armed populations fighting people? Well, Switzerland weren't invaded during World War II, and I know uh, some of you will say, well, they had a geographical advantage right. because of the mountainous regions. Okay, but you know what? Let's use another example. Direct quote from Japanese military. When they were asked why they didn't invite the United States after yeah. Pearl Harbor, said there would have been a gun behind every blade of grass. By the way, Japanese yeah. very flowery. What's yeah. your excuse, Hirono? Don't you think I know how to do poetry? Give me credit. I give you no credit. Swine. None. None whatsoever. <laughs> Venezuela, oh my this is what's so important. It's it's so predictable. There's nothing yeah. unique about Venezuela. All. It, it would be, if you could find an exception, no, all big government and socialist leaders disarm their citizens. Yes. Every, Every Soviet Union, Cuba, one. Nazi Germany. So Socialism, with so, socialism, disarmament is the rule. Mm. Not the exception. Yeah. In every case. Yeah. And one of the things I'm, I'm I'm baffled at how people are forgetting recent military history. Vietnam. Right. Vietnam. Think about this. Insurgents will always yeah. outlast an invading. Yeah. Always. You know why? Because the Taliban. They're not centralized. You can't, okay? Wouldn't they nuke them? Fine. They would nuke a city. There's millions more. We're not centralized. Yeah. All standing in one place, saying we're going to fight you from here. Right. It is one of the most impossible tasks. Look at Afghanistan. Ten years. Fifteen years later. We're still trying to take care of an insurgency. Right. Right? Yeah. So we would absolutely. And we can't. As a matter of fact, I'm pretty sure we'll talk with uh, Senator Rand Paul after the break, and he'll tell us that I, I know he doesn't think we should still be there because he thinks right. it's unwinnable. Yeah. But say something about it. That was because, I mean, to, good point. To, I mean to, uh, to contradict Joe a little bit, when you think U.S. history only started in January 2009, what's a Vietnam? Right. Yeah, yeah exactly. exactly. Yeah. 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 I, I understand that, but man. Well, lesson number We're two, this one is kind of an aside, but I wanted to include it. Is that we learned that Trump is in a Russian stooge. Oh, really? My important one, though. <laughs> so th this is really simple. Putin has supported Maduro uh, openly and repeatedly. Yeah. Maduro was actually readying a plane, did you know that, to escape to Cuba? Yeah, he was out. Before, he was done. <laughs> before the Russians convinced him not to. And, I, I don't uh, know how. I, I, back in, in in January, Trump issued a statement officially recognizing one other guy, one, one, <laughs> one other guy, one last name uh, as the interim guy. president of Venezuela. Guaido. And by the way, it's also important to note that uh, you know Russia's had uh, cozy relations with with Cuba, and if yeah. you look at Donald Trump and mm. uh, Bolton and their, their not only their sanctions but their, yeah. their rhetoric on Cuba, again, this just backs it up. But if you don't believe me. And I don't think you should believe me. You should never <laughs> Hold your believe feet me. to the fire. Don't a little believe bit here. me. Believe your lion eyes and believe your lion ears. Uh, here's President Trump meeting with one other guy's wife, uh, telling her that her husband is 100 percent the president. When asked about Russia, by the way, he couldn't be more clear. We are with Venezuela. We are with 
your husband, as you know, and you're with the people that he represents, which is a big, big majority of uh, the country. Mr. President, what sort of complications does the Russian involvement now pose? Russia has to get out. <laughs> what? All right, what's your next question? <laughs> Someone's in the Kremlin's uh, oh! Oh! <laughs> That's awesome. What do you think about Russia? <laughs> Scrub! Yeah, okay. <laughs> they right. get out. Like, it couldn't be more forceful. Yeah, bro. No, I mean, I'm just thinking about this now. When Trump did this, didn't Cortez, Omar, and like the other the three stooges like attack him for it? Like, why are you getting involved? We shouldn't be intervening. I I th no, I think you're thinking about Omar ranting about the Jews. Yeah. Oh, exactly. okay. Yeah, right. You're getting it confused. confused. Well, but, right. Hold on. I have, I'm, I'm a little confused here. I, have I, think, a, I think you're right. They did. Yeah. I have a legitimate question. Wouldn't so if Russia is this socialist, Marxist, whatever, like the alternative to capitalist society over here that they want to usher in, wouldn't they want Donald Trump to be a stooge of the Russians so that it would happen here? Why, why, why are they so well, opposed to the it's, it's not really that they, anymore. Why are they so opposed to the Russia connection if Russia has helped communism spread around the world exactly. and socialism by extension? It's so confusing right, to me. Right. Wouldn't they want that? Why are they fighting against that so much and tarring him like that? Because you're a racist. Well, <laughs> hey, listen, no. None of this makes any sense to me! Hey, come on. I'm the host. Give me credit that I know a little bit what I'm talking about here. No, no. Well, hold on. Can you give me specifics? I, I relinquish my time. <laughs> no, here's the final lesson. You have four minutes and 59 uh, seconds left, sir. Not only does socialism not work, but the macro really works. Socialism is outright evil. And I've talked yes. about this many times. Yes. It's not compassionate. No. Maduro's army, they're running people down in the streets, shooting them. Yeah. This is where socialism always ends. How is there yeah. any question as to this being pure evil? Venezuela, again, it's not an outlier. Nope. For the 20th century, socialist Marxist regimes have killed over 100 million people. Tell that to your edgy Easily. atheist friend who talks about all religions being fought in the name, <laughs> yeah. all, all wars being fought in the, the name, name of religion. religion. Yes. And I don't understand. Please answer me. How is this a surprise to anyone? If only we had the literal exact comparison of a Marxist out of control government running over dissidents with tanks in the history books. Is it possible? <laughs> Somewhere, maybe. You starting to get the picture? And this is what this is no. the issue. We have to go to Rand Paul, uh, Senator Rand Paul in a little bit. Socialism it starts with it can only function with an entirely powerless and entirely defenseless society. Yeah. The two are different things. When I say powerless, I mean people who are reliant on the government for their health care, reliant yeah. on the government for their education, yep. reliant on the government for their welfare, for their ability to live. You suck yeah. the soul straight from somebody's body. And when I talk about defenseless, I'm talking about systematic disarmament. And one, of course, precedes the other. This, this is one thing, too, that, that, that you can't, I think Thomas Sowell talked about this, you can't blame the leaders who seize control that you've willingly given it yeah, given yeah. to them. You can, at some point, maybe it was democratic, but guess what? At some point, it's not going to be. Let's not say Bernie Sanders is a Maduro. I don't right. think he would be. Maybe not the next guy, but it could be the next guy and the next guy and the next guy, and you're too far in yeah. because you're dependent on the government based on these policies because you thought you were getting a gimme. And let me, let me, something else here that I think is important to note. Capitalism is not flawless. No one here is arguing not. that. Free enterprise, of course, has its problems. But if I'm wrong, and this is the issue, the idea of, of dispersing power, of it not being centralized. If I'm wrong and Bill Gates and Jeff Bezos are corrupt and they become like Maduro's, you know what? A few, thousands of people lose their jobs. The economy is going to do pretty poorly. Yeah, it'll be catastrophic economically for a lot of people. If you're wrong, people get starved and run over with tanks. So if you're going to take the lesser of two evils, let me know what you pick. We have Senator Rand Paul after the break. Yeah. Let's all try some waffle. Let's all try some waffle. Let's all try some waffle because they are badass. Walther Firearms. Quality firearm engineering for over a century. Sleek lines, butter smooth triggers, and unparalleled reliability. Walther created the first semi-automatic pistol in 1908, and they've made the best ever since. So the next chance you have, demand loudly and proudly. I'll try the Walther. Let's all try some Walther, because they are best. Hello there, YouTube viewer. 
I'm here with my dungeon sex slave half Asian tattoo, here to tell you about Mug Club and why you should join to support this content. What the thief would both, would you ski? Oh, my dear half Asian tattoo. We don't use safe words, and neither should you. Behind the paywall at louderwithcrowder.com slash mug club, where everything is fair game. Joy, or I'll drown him in a bathtub. Like you asked, that how many genders there are, we don't need to define that. There can be an infinite number of genders. It's all about what you define. I could go around wearing a dress if that's what I particularly wanted to but do. But are you still a boy then? Because you have a penis, I, I would assume. Open your mind. Let us begin our quest to find Hey, Cordy Blackheart, what is yeah. pop locking exactly? Pop locking. I is don't it know. different I from think it's the like, robot? It's like some of It's more some like. Of is it more? Yeah. Like some of the, it's like the robot, like, but you you're pop lock it, but you're dislocating yeah. joints. Pop it. Then you lock it. I don't know. It. Seems to be like a cultural blind spot for myself. It, it myself. I, I need. I need I'm to check sure. that out. I'm very glad to have our next guest. We've had so yes. many requests for him to be on. He's obviously immensely popular with uh, a lot of younger political activists, particularly millennials mm -hmm. who are conservatives. His his brand of. Uh, conservatism. I, mm -hmm. I would want him to represent himself, but uh, really seems to resonate with him. You can follow him on the Twitter, at Rand Paul, in case you yep. don't know who it is. We'll be talking about his introduced plan called the Penny Plan uh, to balance the budget, uh, among other things. Yeah. Senator Rand Paul, thank you for being here, sir. Well, thank you, but if they follow me on the Twitter, would that be on the internet? It would be, at, yes. At Walmart? Correct. So long and as it I, remains ne neutrality. Yeah, that's... I want to make sure where they would go, to the Twitter. <laughs> to the Twitter. Yeah, the Twitter and the, the, the YouTubes and the books of faces where that uh, Game of Thrones girl also learns to become an assassin, I think. I'm not entirely clear. You're probably more in touch than I am, Senator. You seem to really have your finger to the pulse of what's going on online. Well, we have discovered today, have you seen the new White Walker uh, calendar? No, it sounds horrifying in the sense that people who would purchase it sound horrifying. <laughs> Well, the White Walker calendar has uh, Senate Republicans depicted as White Walkers. Oh. It's sort of some creative Photoshopping. It's actually quite good. You might want to get your hands on it. No, I'm not going to lie. I don't mean this in any of the demonic undead sense, but because of the white hair and the lighter eyes, it wouldn't require too creative Photoshopping to make you a White Walker. Oh, no, but I'm, I'm, on, I'm on the good side. There's good and evil, and I think it just the evil is being depicted as what. So whoever made this must not have thought I was evil enough. Make no. a, make I'm thought. on the white worker side anyways. Yeah, you know, at a certain point when the story when the storylines get all muddled, yeah. I'm like, you know what? I just want this whole thing to fall. <laughs> um, first off, before we get to the penny plan, which is incredibly interesting, I think people w would love to hear about it. Have you, I, I know you've been busy. Have you been following um, the bar hearing this week? What, what's, what's your take on that? Uh, just peripherally, and a lot of people have been talking about it on the floor of the Senate. You know, I wasn't part of the hearings. Right. But, uh, yeah, I've been hearing from Lindsey Graham and others that uh, it seems like the other side sort of lost it. I mean, uh, maybe just went uh, completely bonkers, you know, over bar, yelling and screaming at him, calling him a liar. And um, I guess from my point of view, it sounds like that even Mueller doesn't dispute anything that Barr said. Everything Barr said was accurate. He just wanted more released of, uh, I guess, his narrative that he wrote about the whole thing. But I guess my point of view on the whole Mueller report and the whole reveal is that if you're not indicted for something, the government shouldn't release anything. Right. You know, I was against the Mueller report, and it was the same would go for Hillary Clinton. I actually think Comey did a disservice to all of us, including the FBI, when he came forward and said, oh, we're not indicting her. But she really seems guilty as hell on these three different things. Right. The government shouldn't do that because think about it from your perspective or an ordinary citizen's perspective that if the government accused you of a terrible crime mm -hmm. that would make you a pariah in your whole community, yeah. but then it turns out you didn't commit it, would you want the government to say, even Krauss did not commit this horrendous crime, and yet we're going to write a 400-page narrative describing all the things 
that he might have done that we think are kind of shady, but he didn't commit the horrendous crime. I wouldn't want the government writing a 400 page uh, report on what I've done today before lunch. <laughs> I'd be incredibly embarrassed. And I don't think you would appear on this program. But that was actually going to be my first question because you, you blocked a resolution calling for the release of the, the Mueller report. And listen, you're, you're obviously seen as an advocate for government transparency. You're, you're kind of seen as that, uh, that, that candidate, the torchbearer, if you will. So for those folks not in the know, you know, you explained also when you blocked this, this uh, resolution, also, that it was important to understand the origins of where the investigation began. So for people who might say, well, I'm surprised Senator Rand Paul blocked this. Why didn't you want the report released? Explain the context. Well, see, I'm, I'm an advocate for individual liberty. And so I'm an advocate for the individual. And I'm an advocate for government being controlled and restrained from what it can do to individuals. So I look at a prosecution or a prosecution where they do not find something that they can actually prove someone is guilty of that the individual deserves the protection, that mm -hmm. not the government. There isn't an overriding sort of, oh, we must be transparent about something that could destroy an individual where we didn't actually have proof that they committed a crime. So I think in this case, the individual's rights would trump any sort of argument for transparency. Now, in general, should the government try to be transparent? Sure. sure. But really, it's always about how big is the government? What does the government do to the individual? And what do we do to protect the individual from a government that might grow too large. And this is what I, I told the president. I was with the president this weekend, we played golf, and I said, they've mistreated you. The intelligence agencies have mistreated you. The special prosecutor has. But my advice is that he needs to generalize this and talk about what would happen, for example, if the government could look at all the tax returns of everyone they didn't like, a political enemies list. Right. So Republicans get mad, they look at all the Democrats' tax returns. Democrats get mad, they look at Republicans. Or what if we had special prosecutors for everybody? And so we don't know that there's a crime you've committed, but we say, you know, what we do is we have a person and we're going to look for wrongdoing. Mm -hmm. That that is an injustice. And it's important that people realize and remember that there's a burden on the government to prove guilt. And that's a tough burden. We do it intentionally because we want to give the any kind of degree of doubt to the individual. We want to make the government have a, a bigger burden. Their burden is to prove guilt. Right. And one way Mueller really screwed up in this report is Mueller failed in the one sense of understanding that the burden of guilt comes to the government because he says at one point, oh, but we cannot exonerate the president. I think he actually uses those words. Right. Well, that's not, that's not his business. And it's not the business of government to exonerate. The business of government is to overcome a hurdle. And it's his burden of proof to prove someone's guilt. Because if we had to prove everyone innocent, it's like, Oh, well, I'm pretty sure Stephen didn't do that, and we're not going to indict you, but I can't absolutely say that Stephen's completely innocent of all crime. Right. The, the innuendo of that and, and the government's full force and power, it's a terrible power. We have to be very careful, and I've decided I won't ever vote for a special prosecutor because I don't think it's the right justice. We have grand juries. We have normal prosecutors. We don't need special prosecutors that go through everybody's life from the beginning of time. That's a very good point. And that leads to the innuendo of, you know, Donald Trump angrily tweeting or saying, I didn't do anything. And them saying, hold on a second. Is that obstruction? Right. It, go, it leads to that. Well, hold on a second. If there's no crime, how can we now uh, declare it to be obstruction? And it really does become a slippery slope. And I'm amazed at the media coverage of this. Right. And I think you're exactly right. How can you obstruct something that wasn't a crime? And actually, no one's actually saying he did obstruct anything. There's nothing he actually did that stopped the wheels from turning. The Mueller investigation went forward, $35 million worth. You know, I don't know where there was actual obstruction. Did people talk about ways we can try to get the stupid Mueller investigation over? I think they did talk about that. Right. But there was no crime, and it turns out it was a false allegation. So if you're falsely accused of something and you try to get the charges dismissed— and you work hard to make sure that whoever's trying to accuse you of the false crimes doesn't succeed, are right. you obstructing justice? Are you actually uh, helping and abetting justice? Or even it gets to the point, you know, where Barr answered a question from, a, I, th I think it was Kamala Harris. Yes, it was Kamala Harris. And she, she asked a question. She said, uh, have you, uh, had, has the president, I want to make sure I get this correct. Has the president or anyone else instructed you to investigate anybody? And they're trying to act as though that's an own. I'm going, wait, and, and uh, Barr said, uh, uh, I'm grappling with the word anyone else. It's like asking, hold on, have you, Senator Rand Paul, 
or anyone else ever said anything bad about anyone. And then if you say, I don't think so, is that obstruction? It seems mm. like they're going to more generalized questions. If you look at the hearing, it was no longer about legality. It was about if he's a nice guy or not. Right. Well, I think they're getting at whether the president has asked them to investigate the investigators, the ones right. who came up with this fake dossier, should they? And I think uh, they should, because I think it's very important that we had the head of the CIA, John Brennan, who swear, swore under testimony that he never saw this dossier till January. Well, he had a task force for six months looking into this and had members of the FBI on his team. You think he never saw one of those letters from Christopher Steele? I think he's parsing words, and this is the kind of stuff that they'll do to you. The dossier wasn't a dossier until they put all the letters together. Right. Before that, there was 20 individual letters. So I think you read the letters, and then when they were put together in a folder and called a dossier, he says, well, I have not seen the dossier. Obstruction. He, <laughs> yeah. You know, but really, so much of this uh, originated in government. Government took a dossier that no one would believe, and to get people to believe it, they gave it to people like John McCain, who then gave it back to the government. The FBI's got, well, John McCain gave us this dossier. Well, we already had it, but he gave it back to us. And now we need to investigate because a senator has given us right. what we already had that we gave to him to begin with. Well, look what we found in Senator Rand Paul's recycling bin. You put it there. <laughs> Let's not get into details here. Um, let me ask you this, because you've obviously been a critic of President Trump uh, in the past, and I think you've supported I think you've been very fair. What is it like? You said you played golf with him. Is, is, is it tense at all? Do you have a good working relationship together? You know, we get along pretty well. We both love the game of golf, which helps. Uh, he's very competitive, and so we have a good uh, competitive round usually when we play. And really, it doesn't get overly serious. But I can tell you through the round and being around him a long time and hearing his statements that I'm very encouraged by some of his sentiments and his instincts. And I'll give you an example. In the State of the Union, he said that great nations don't fight perpetual wars. I couldn't agree more. None of the Bushes would have ever said that. None of the establishment Republicans would have ever said that. It takes somebody who hasn't been muddled and drugged down by all of the establishment neoconservative rhetoric to say something like that. But it's exactly what I believe, right. that nations don't fight perpetual war. And in private and in public, when I talk to him, he says that he wants to be the president that gets, uh, you know, that ends some of these wars. In Afghanistan, we're spending $50 billion a year there's not a general left at the Pentagon who actually believes that there is a military solution in Afghanistan. So I don't want to send the last kid or send one of my family members over there to fight in a war where every general is saying there is no military solution. We're right. going to take one more village so we can have a better negotiated settlement. Look, if the people over there don't want their current government, they're going to get rid of them. And frankly, the current government's full of a bunch of thieves, drug warlords. They grow more poppy in Afghanistan than they ever have, even though the U.S. government and the taxpayer spend $8 billion trying to wipe out their poppy crop. They grow more than they've ever grown. Right. I mean, it's a complete waste. You could, you'd do better probably to burn the money if we just put it in a big burn bin and burned it. Well, I actually knew a kid in high school who spent $800 on pop, but it was California poppy which actually is not the same. He thought yeah. he was going to make poppy tea and get blitzed. And he was a very uh -huh. dumb person, never made it to college. But before I get to the penny plan, uh, which is what I want to get to, you mentioned that. So I, I, I am curious, uh, how, how does that go when you speak with the president uh, on, on Syria, for example? Obviously, you've adamantly been calling for withdrawal of troops uh, from Syria. Do you have those conversations? You know, I think where there's agreement is that he believes that uh, the Iraq war was a mistake that toppling the Iraq regime made Iran stronger and made the Middle East, uh, there, there's more unrest in the Middle East because of the Iraq war. Right. I think he thinks that leaving troops in Syria, that Syria is such a mess, uh, will lead to more problems. Now, his advisors are neoconservatives and people who are the stay forever crowd. They've convinced him to leave 200. But I think actually leaving 200 is worse than leaving 20,000, frankly, because 20,000 aren't going to be picked off by a suicide bomber. 200 right. could. You know, it happened at the barracks in Beirut. Ronald Reagan decided, you know, this place is, you know, crazy over there and we're just not staying. And he brought the troops home from Lebanon. Um, I think uh, Trump has great instincts on that. And even at the very least, if he put them on, you know, I'm not for staying forever in Iraq also, but it'd be better to have them on a military base in Iraq than it would be in the middle of that war in between the Turks, the jihadists, 
which some on our side call allies. We armed jihadists. Right. Probably for five years, we sent arms to people who hate us, who would just soon skin us alive, who hate Israel. That's who we were sending uh, arms to throughout that because we thought they'd be better than Assad. I'm not positive that the people we were arming were any better or would be better than Assad. It seems like it's always a struggle because obviously when you think you're dealing with the worst evil, you ally yourself, uh, you ally yourselves with the people who you think would, would do the least amount of damage. And then, you know, hindsight is, is, is 20, 20. Um, okay. I do want to get to, because we can talk about this all day and I really appreciate it, but the penny plan, your plan to balance the budget for people who don't know, I know they can follow you on Twitter. They can go check it out on YouTube. Explain it to them. We have a problem a debt, $22 trillion debt. Every year now, we're adding about a trillion to it. Seems statistically significant. I'm with you. Approximately, we spend approximately $4 trillion, and we bring in about $3 trillion. Those are rounded numbers, but that's about it. And so what we would like to do is actually cut on the spending side. But we want people to realize that it actually wouldn't be as dramatic as people make it out to be. People are like, oh, it's too much. We can never do it. So nothing ever gets done, and everybody says, oh, we never could, we could never cut. So... What I've come up with is a plan is to cut 1%. So 1% of $4 trillion is $40 billion. Right. Not so bad. You do it every year for five years. And for the last several years, if you did one penny a year for five years, the budget balanced. But because we don't do the penny plan, it's actually a little bit harder. So we actually, this year, we had to rename it. It's confusing marketing. We're having to call it the two-penny plan. <laughs> okay. <laughs> now you, you have to spend 98% of what you spent last year, but you do it for five years. But here's the rub, and it leads to one of the big lies of Washington. So when I present this, and when the media reports it, they'll say that I'm cutting $10 trillion. And I'm telling you it's $40 billion. So how do we figure out the difference? Government is increasing at about 6 or 7% a year. So over the next 10 years, government will go from, you know, it'll, it'll increase $10 trillion in spending. So if you freeze spending, how much are you cutting? They would say you're cutting $10 trillion. I would say you're not cutting any if you free spend. Mm, right. And most American taxpayers would say if we spend the same amount last year or next year as we spent last year, that's not a cut, is it? Oh, no, no. In Washington, we were going to increase by $100 billion, so that's a $100 billion cut. So we have to explain to people the whole math, and the, the media is so biased in this that it's hard for people to get – but if we can get directly to the people and say just cut 1%. So every – Every day in my office, a half a dozen groups come in with their hands out like this. Can you see my hands? Yeah, yeah, these I can see hands. These are called the, the beseechers. Okay. They come for money. And I explain to them, we don't have any money. Did you see the debt clock in the front office spinning wildly out of control? We have no money. And so then I say, I tell you what, I'll make a deal with you. So your group last year got $100 million. Could you live with $99 million next year? And I said, well... Everybody, that would happen to everybody that gets money from government if he 1% left. Almost every one of them, even the liberals who believe that money grows on trees, if you tell them that the country is being weakened by this debt, that everybody would get one penny reduction. Everybody would get 99 cents on the dollar. Could you live with that for, for the next five years if everybody does it for the betterment of the country? Every one of them actually says yes. Right. But you can't find one liberal in Washington, one Democrat, that will vote for that. The problem is not just the Democrats. No Democrat will vote to cut any spending. They won't vote for any. Right. But over half the Republicans are the same. They won't vote to cut any spending either. So really, there's 53 Republicans. There's about 10 to 15 that will vote for the penny plan. The okay. rest of them will take a pass. Well, I, that was going to be my follow-up question, because if we're going to talk about the two-penny plan, the penny plan of 1% or 2%, I was going to ask, wh where do you cut it? Because, of course, you know, if anyone goes back and watches The West Wing, they make it seem as the Republicans only want to put c cuts into health care and Medicare and, uh, and education, and then the left, uh, they always only want to make cuts in national defense. So you're talking about putting that 1% or 2% cut across the board. Yeah, I would do it across the board. Now, obviously, it would be left up to the spending committees. Right. The rules basically say it's 1%. If you choose to cut 100% of something and, and, and increase another category, you could. But here's the reason you probably should do it across the board. What we have is the opposite now. Democrats want to increase social welfare spending. Republicans want to increase military spending. So what happens every year is there is bipartisan compromise. In fact, the most misreported fact of all media, the biggest of all fake news is that there's no compromise up here. They compromise every day. That's the problem. They compromise to spend more money. Mm -hmm. They increase welfare. 
and they increase the military. Guns and butter, everything goes up. But the military spending can only go up if you give the Democrats welfare spending so they'll vote for the military spending and vice versa. Right. Now, the reverse could work. The reverse could work. You could actually cut a little bit from everything and actually bring down spending. But the opposite compromise, the bipartisan right. compromise to spend more money has been going on for ever since probably FDR. Really. really. And the thing is, you can find almost all politicians at some point saying, yeah, there is some wasteful government spending. They're just usually attributing it to the other side. Or like you said, the left often attributes it to the military and the right often attributes it to social welfare states. So it seems you're saying only 15, 20 Republicans would vote for this. So I hate to say it, but you pitch this wonderful plan that to people watching, we say, well, that makes sense. And then you make us feel hopeless. So what can people do to support it and get it, get it going? The penny plan, where can they go? What should they do? Beat the you know what out of your legislators, beat them over the head with the telephone, call them, email them and tell them, why won't you vote for this? And then nominate somebody else. You have a primary, go out there and get better Republicans. And so I think the primaries are the place to pro place to play and the place to put your effort. Not as many people vote in the primaries, so your vote counts more, your money counts more. Uh, so I would go out there and try to get better people to represent you. And I think uh, the louder people are, the better. The other thing is, is by my having the vote, even though I know I won't win because I know these people, I've, I'm around them all the time. I know no Democrat will vote to cut the deficit, and I know half the Republicans won't. But by forcing them to vote, it embarrasses them, and it puts them on record, and maybe one of them goes home and has a, a strong primary challenge and says, why didn't you vote for the penny plan? So it has the potential to actually upset the apple cart and get new people up here. Here's the problem, though. They don't want to let me have the vote. I will only get the vote if I force them to, which is what we're craftily, very secretly, and I can't tell you all the secret tricks we're using to force the vote, but we think we will get a vote in the next week or two. Well, see, that's the problem, is then you force the vote and you radicalize young young youth into into cutting 1% spending. I don't know who you think you are, Senator Rand Paul, but you out with the White Walkers. All right, we do have to get going. That is at Rand Paul on the Twitters. Mm -hmm. Senator Rand Paul, one of my favorite guests. I do hope that it doesn't take this long to get you back. I really appreciate it, and I do hope that we see this vote. Thanks, Stephen. Thanks for having me. Thank you very much. God bless. We'll be back to wrap this up after this. Just do one like this. <laughs> I am a lawyer. I f you off, mother <laughs> I f you off, boss. <laughs> and we win every time. Fuck, fuck, fuck. I'm the fucking person. <sighs> they always do. Oh, hold on, I was laughing. <laughs> Mug club. Oh, no, I'm gonna do it just guest in character. The plaintiff. That doesn't even make sense. Why did I say the plaintiff? That's it? Just do one like this. I am a lawyer. <laughs> you all. Hey there, Steven Crowder here with an important safety message. Now I know that Sunday is Cinco de Mayo and you're going to enjoy your festivities and I want you to have your fun. Take part in your neighborhood, contribute. And of course, be sure to alert your local authorities. The number is below. Happy Five. Sir, we're gonna take these funds for the old town road. We're gonna buy a ton of black asphalt. Right. We're gonna take these funds for the old town road. We're gonna yeah. pave yeah. and also fix potholes. Or we could take these funds for the old town road and maybe build a brand new stadium. Sir, it's our end hired job to fix the old town road we must ensure that is he even listening i'm thinking no this is so exciting look the roof is shining so touched by this project i named it joe biden sir this is dismaying taxpayers are paying ha. studies show these never la, create la, 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 economic can't growth what you're saying can't nobody tell me nothing you can't tell him nothing can't nobody tell me nothing You can't tell him
called the, when I first learned to swim and I wasn't confident and I wasn't supposed to be in the water, I went in the water anyway and I would just push off edges and <gasps> grab a breath. And then I would push off the ladder and go, <gasps> yeah. that's what I did. It's horribly I'm dangerous, lucky. by the way. I'm yeah. amazed. At, we get it. You want to be black. <laughs> They've rejected you. Hey. Nature hasn't been kind. They haven't taken you in as one of their own. Uh, you were telling me about something during the break. Thank you, Senator Rand Paul, thank you, by thank the way. You. Uh, next, keep, keep in mind, next week, there will be a Change My Mind. Uh, Ooh, you guys yeah. saw the teaser. There will be a Change My Mind on Tuesday. There won't be any other shows because, A, Change My Mind takes a lot of work, and we're moving into a new studio. Yes. So we're moving um, all of the edit bay, green screen, where we tape all this, all that's going to a new space. And then uh, the next phase is going to be this actual studio, moving to that space as well, so that we don't miss, like, two weeks of shows. Yes. Yeah. You were just telling me something, you and Too Cute Maddie, something you were mad about Burger yeah. King? Yeah. So Burger King just released this idiotic ad today. Okay. It's, uh, it's okay to feel your way. Hmm. So uh, a, a fast food chain... Yeah. Sells cheeseburgers. Yeah. Um, has an ad about depression and sadness and saying, F you, boss. Like, it's just this, like, student Does film. Does it actually show a kid writing F you, boss? No, it's some, it's some. Oh, okay. All they're right. all millennials. Yeah. So, you're of course, you're not, you're not advertising to people going, hey, like, it's okay to be, like, happy meal. It's you okay know, to be let's, happy. Be, let's yeah. be happy. Let's all be super depressed. And, like, it's probably because they're eating at Burger cheeseburgers. King. Cheeseburgers. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> this is how you feel King after kind of, cheeseburgers. I used to love Burger King when I was a kid and I was trying to work out I love their fries, muscle. but then they changed it. I, um, I, the thing is, I would eat a double beef whopper with, che- with cheese, and I, th- it would get on your fingers, and it, it stays with you the whole day, mm. just like you to remind you of your bad right. decisions. Like you're, later, you're, you're eat- you, that night, you could be eating chicken breast and broccoli, and it's like, doesn't matter. Remember me? You're like, oh damn, <laughs> this doesn't make BK. up for it at all. Oh no. Oh uh, well, I, I haven't seen the commercial, but I'll it's need horrible. to see it. It's horrible. I'll show and, you. Uh, I don't really know that it's worth that much time. Then we just wasted. Uh, <laughs> Hey, I wanted to say, uh, uh, I want to offer a shout out to my father-in-law here. He's, he's a great man. L- love him. He had a, a, I haven't really talked to you guys, he had a, a blood infection oh, this man. week. Actually got uh, sepsis. Uh, and uh, it was really, really tough. Uh, seems like he's doing better. He's okay, gone home. And say, when I was looking okay? it up, I was like, well, man, this can be pretty severe. And because I didn't want to upset my wife. And yeah. there's nothing we can do because they're in another state. It's one of the things like I talked about is men, sometimes you don't lie to your wife. You're like, oh, well, you know what? That's That, that can be that can be okay. Yeah. Uh, but the truth is it's really tough, can cause a lot of organ damage. Anyone who has a uh, – and he, he does seem to be doing well, but anyone who has info on that um, would appreciate it. Maybe you, you send me some because we'll, we'll take all the help we can get. Yeah. Um, and my wife and I, it was pretty tough, had to, had to come for this this week. And, uh, you know, I, I really – I just – there's nothing – people often say, oh, you're saying that because I love my wife. I love my father-in-law. I'm really fortunate. I love my mother-in-law. I love my father-in-law. I love my, my mother and my father and my wife. And we really – we all get along pretty well. But I will say this. My wife and I have had uh, – conflicts quite a bit and same with my father-in-law he's a great man we've gotten into it a few times and i think it's important this is what i wanted to talk about today conflict is not inherently immoral i think this ties into what we were talking about with with venezuela this is why i push for truth over middle ground common ground is fine if it's founded on truth but middle ground isn't if it's founded on a lie it's just a polite lie we have an entire generation of people kind of like you're talking about with with burger king who believe that conflict in and of itself is immoral or even impolite. No, conflict leads to breakthrough. Conflict leads to resolution. That's the goal of conflict. My parents have been together 30 years. Uh, I, my, my wife's parents have been together, I want to say 40 something, her grandparents 60 plus years before he got Alzheimer's. I used to see my parents argue a lot as kids. They worked it out. French Canadian, Italian Americans, they have nothing on French Canadians. My mother is a, you know her, she's a, she knows what oh, she yeah. wants. Yes. She can be a pushy woman, so can my wife. They worked it out though. So I used to see my parents argue and I used to watch them work it out. The alternative to those conflicts and the subsequent resolution is divorce. And when you have a generation of people who were raised on the, you just need to make yourself happy. You do you. If you're not happy in your marriage, you need to make yourself happy. If you're not happy in your job, just find something else. Life's too short. You need to be happy. And how many of those people do you find end up being, end up being happier because of it? More importantly, okay, how many of them end up becoming more fulfilled? Those decisions for short-term gain. And this is a part of the leftist worldview, which ironically is, is rooted in absolutism. In trying to be staunchly opposed to moral absolutism, one of the only absolutes that many leftists, but many progressives believe is, is that conflict is wrong or that violence is wrong. But we're not even talking about that today. You know what happens in a war scenario without conflict? Genocide. Do you know what happens on a campus bereft of ideological conflict? 
Propaganda. Indoctrination. Do you know what happens in a marriage without conflict? Happy? No. Divorce. Complacency. And I get it, conflict is uncomfortable, as it's, it's easy to sell people a worldview or a political ideology that tells them their discomfort is unnecessary, unwarranted, or it's out of their control, and it promises to end all conflicts for them. I'm telling you right now that conflict is unavoidable. You can live your whole life trying to be Mr. Nice Guy, Mr. Milk Toast, avoid discussing religion and politics, avoid standing up for anything, try to fly under the radar. Conflict at some point will find you, period. And that's why I think it's important for everyone else to, but I accept conflict as a fact of life. And rather than avoid it, I want to see more people learn conflict resolution. Rather than learn how to not fight in a marriage, I want to... F no one's going to learn how to not fight in a marriage. No one's going to learn how to be comfortable their whole life. No one's going to learn how to be happy their whole life. But you can learn to find resolutions through the conflict. Do you find yourself avoiding conflict of hard conversations? Or have, have you learned how to change people's minds? It's one or the other. Do you avoid the conflicts of your marriage? Do you let it boil over? Or do you hash out? Do you learn how to meet each other's needs? Compromise. Do you avoid the conflict of your coworkers or your friends by trying to move up in the ranks. That's one thing that happens a lot, right? You try to move up in your job and people get mad. They don't like you anymore. I learned this when I became, when I became a boss who employed, there were some people didn't like me anymore. That happens. You do that in your workplace. As a result, you become complacent. Here's the thing about conflict. Um, and this is why I think it's so scary. When you're in it, you don't know how it ends. When you're on that ascent, you don't know what happens on the other side of that crest. Think, think of riding a bike up a hill. Okay, it's hard and it sucks. But you often make up for time on the other side. That difficult initial climb, and it sucks, don't get me wrong, makes the rest of the ride easier, more efficient. And I don't want you to mistake this, what I'm talking about right here. Um, for I don't want you to mistake it with advising you to live a caustic life or to be one of those unbearable people looking for a fight when there, there needn't be one. That's not what I'm talking about. Uh, but it's like we were talking about earlier with Venezuela. Do you know what the alternative is to a civil war? Genocide or continued subjugation. And I see that on a micro level happen to so many people. Uh, people who email us on the life advice shows that we do for those who are Mug Club members. People who spend their whole lives avoiding conflict and then, then they wonder where they went wrong. Don't be that person. I want you to think about this for a second. Think, is there a conflict that maybe you've been avoiding in your life that you've been putting off because you know it's hard and it's uncomfortable, but it's necessary? We all have it. We've all done it. Don't be that person. If you find yourself in conflicts throughout your life, listen, you're going to lose some. Yeah. That's unavoidable. But if you avoid the fight your whole life, I guarantee you that you'll find yourself in a prison of your own making, haunted for the rest of your life by the idea of what could have been. Don't be that person. Don't avoid conflict because it's uncomfortable. All right, I'll see you next week, but not before Thursday. Well, change my mind Tuesday. <laughs>